Most people would say that Steve Jobs was a genius, but you'd be mistaken to think that he and Apple never took some people would say stole ideas and designs from other businesses. Take the German company Braun and their legendary designer Dieter Ram. Here's the Braun T3 transistor radio created by Rams, and here's the original 2001 iPod. Here's the Braun infrared emitter and Apple's iSight camera. The Braun T1000 radio and the Apple Power Mac G5. The Braun LE1 speaker and the 2009 iMac. And here's Braun's 1997 calculator and the iPhone calculator app. But Jobs never hid the truth that his best ideas often came from other people. In fact, he was open with his constant search to find the best possible people to steal ideas from. And the single biggest influence on Steve Jobs that most people don't know about was this guy, Edwin Land, the founder of Polaroid. Land was basically the Tony Stark of his time. After dropping out of Harvard at the age of 19 in 1928, he started producing a crazy amount of inventions. Polarizing light filters, full color 3D glasses, color animation for jukeboxes, military goggles, smart bombs, and vectograph photography. With 553 lifetime patents, Edwin Land was second to only Thomas Edison. But his biggest achievement was the Polaroid instant camera. Before Polaroid came along, photographers would have to shoot their film and send it to a lab to get developed, which took days. But Land put that whole process into a tiny box you could carry in your pocket so that anyone could just point their camera, press a button, and instantly get a photo. Jobs loved Land, called him one of his heroes, and when he finally got to meet the inventor, he said it was like visiting a shrine. In so many ways, Apple was successful because Jobs modeled it after how Land built Polaroid. So in this video, we'll look at exactly what Jobs took from Land and reconstruct the playbook that Jobs used twice to turn Apple into the world's most iconic technology company. The most obvious thing that Steve Jobs inherited from Edwin Land was an obsession with simplicity and user experience. Every product, every interface needed to be a completely natural, intuitive experience for his customer. It has to be intuitive, precognitive. I mean, I wanted to know what you want to do before you even know you want to do it. It's easy to forget how revolutionary the first Macintosh computer was. It was the first mainstream personal computer where you didn't have to be an expert to set it up or load software. It also introduced the mouse to a big audience for the first time. You could just point and click at whatever you liked on the screen. This obsession with simplicity and user experience is baked into Apple's DNA and it almost definitely came from Land's influence. Land's very first Polaroid cameras had self-developing film, which made them a massive jump in ease from old cameras which required a lab to develop film. But you still had to pull tabs and throw switches to make it work. It was an immediate hit, but Land wasn't satisfied. He wanted Polaroid's technology to be even simpler than the Model 95 and have an even more beautiful look and feel in his customers' hands. They were a long way from the dream, which I used to talk about then, of being able to take a wallet out of my pocket and perhaps open the wallet, press a button, close the wallet, and have the picture. So his biggest invention came out in 1972, when Steve Jobs was just 17 years old, the SX-70 camera. 
The SX70 manual said that the camera had only one purpose to free you up from everything cumbersome and tedious about picture taking so that it could become at last the simple creative act it should be. Land took something clunky that everyone else just accepted and shrunk it down into a tiny, beautiful, all-in-one device. Basically, Jobs' game plan at Apple. What we're gonna do is get rid of all these buttons and just make a giant screen. A giant screen. Jobs could certainly talk about the complex technology inside his devices, but he was way more focused on what his customers cared about, the user experience. The coolest thing about iPod is that whole, your entire music library fits in your pocket. You can take your whole music library with you right in your pocket, never before possible. So that's iPod. That simplicity made them lots of money. The market for their products exploded because they were able to be used by everyone, not just experts and specialists. The Swinger, the incredible new low-priced Polaroid land camera for black and white pictures in 10 seconds. Normal people were suddenly using and buying cameras all the time after Polaroid launched the SX-70. And Steve Jobs created multiple tech booms, first with personal computers, then with digital music devices, and finally touchscreen smartphones. Both guys saw the big picture, but obsessing over the small details made their products successful. But Land also knew that amazing engineering wasn't enough. To make your mark, you have to capture people's imaginations. So he gave big, charismatic keynote speeches at shareholder meetings, where he'd just take out a tiny new camera from his pocket and take an instant picture right on stage. So people could really understand what he'd created without being told all the technical details. He created the original tech keynote speech formula. And Jobs took that formula to the next level. He crafted every little part of his speech until it was perfect, borrowing Land's trick of surprising the audience with a sudden product reveal. Jobs and Land both presented their products in a way that would make normal people say, what is that? I want one. They focused on how people would actually use it. Land would say, he'd take a photo and have the picture in seconds. Jobs would say, a thousand songs waiting for you right there in your pocket. Land was also a clever advertiser. He released his inventions to the world's biggest magazines like Time and Life. He'd also commission advertising campaigns that made Polaroid's inventions a staple of American life. This clearly influenced Jobs. In 1984, when IBM was dominating the personal computer market, Steve decided to go on the offensive with some imaginative marketing for the new Apple Macintosh. He hired director Ridley Scott to direct a Super Bowl commercial that positioned IBM as oppressive big brother and Apple as the creative resistance here to destroy the monopoly. On January 24, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. And a little while later, Jobs unveiled the comparatively tiny Macintosh by pulling it out of a box on stage while his audience went nuts. Jobs built this incredible hype for the Apple Macintosh by focusing on people's feelings about his product and putting on a proper show in the process. All stuff he learned from land. Okay, so Edwin Land patented most of the key components in the SX-70 and was the technical brains behind Polaroid's entire operation. A Polaroid exec once admitted that Land was the only person in the company that understood all the technical details of the CX-70's production process. He never got the question that sometimes came at jobs, what can you actually build? You can't write code. 
You're not an engineer. You're not a designer. You can't put a hammer to a nail. So how come 10 times in a day, I read Steve Jobs as a genius? What do you do? I play the orchestra. And you're a good musician. You sit right there. You're the best in your role. Steve Jobs was not the technical brain behind Apple's products the way Edwin Land was. However, they both drove the unifying vision that made it possible for their engineers and designers to work together. What leadership is, is having a vision, being able to articulate that so the people around you can understand it, and getting a consensus on a common vision. In Apple's case, that meant laying out the map within which brilliant people like Steve Wozniak and Johnny Ive could work. When Land and Jobs met in the 1980s, they both spoke of being able to see their product before it actually existed. According to Apple exec John Scully, Land said, I could see what the Polaroid camera should be. It was just as real to me as if it was sitting in front of me before I had ever built one. And Jobs said, yeah, that's exactly how I saw the Macintosh. There was no way to do consumer research on it, so I had to go and create it and then show it to people and say, now what do you think? Both of these guys were breaking boundaries, so they hated market research and focus groups. Land thought that every significant invention must be startling, unexpected, and must come into a world unprepared for it. If the world was prepared for it, it wouldn't be much of an invention. And Jobs followed his hero's line on this pretty exactly. You know what? They're paying us to make those choices. That's what a lot of customers pay us to do, is to try to make the best products we can. And if we succeed, they'll buy them. And if we don't, they won't. And it'll all work itself out. My favorite anecdote, though, connecting these two visionaries is that Land basically predicted the iPhone that Jobs ended up building. In this recording from 1970, you can see this smartphone vision taking place in Land's mind. We are still a long way from the realization of the concept of a camera that would be, oh, like the telephone, something that you use all day long. Camera that you would use as often as your pencil or your eyeglasses. Both of these men were historically great visionaries, but even the best to ever do it don't have a perfect batting average. Land sunk millions of dollars into Polavision that was dead on arrival. Similarly, Jobs swung and missed with the Apple III and Lisa computers. In both cases, they were fired by their boards and forced to leave the companies that they founded. And in both instances, the companies were much worse off without their visionary founders. But also recognize that the engine behind these men's success was their otherworldly work ethic. They both had complete control over their companies, especially when Jobs returned to Apple in 1997. And they used that control to work themselves and their employees incredibly hard. Land said that intense concentration for hour after hour can bring out in people resources that they didn't know they had, and kept his teams working around the clock to get every tiny detail right in his cameras. One of Land's employees even had a phone line in her house especially for him, which she'd answer any time of day. Jobs and Land believed that if they pushed themselves hard, worked on difficult problems, and obsessed over quality, they'd have a competitive advantage because the competition just wouldn't be able to keep up. Land literally said that you should work only on problems that are manifestly important and seem to be nearly impossible to solve. That way, you will have a natural market for your product and no competition. It worked. Land's cameras cornered the photography market for decades. Jobs' original iPod was so far ahead of the competition that Microsoft executives, including Bill Gates, sent emails to each other freaking out about it, saying that Apple is just so far ahead. The dark side of Jobs' work ethic 
was that he was absolutely ruthless with his employees, which ruined many of his working relationships. I've seen Steve be brutal. Uh, and Steve was brutal because he desperately wanted it to be great. He wanted Apple to be great, and he wanted the product to be great, and he wanted you to be great. And if you weren't doing your best work, he was upset. He was angry. He was, you know, because we had, if we do this right, we can build something that's so great. You can't screw this up. There's a parallel here with MJ and Kobe. MJ was really tough on his teammates. Kobe tried to dial that up a level and ended up losing Shaquille O'Neal. Edwin Land was difficult, but inspiring to work for. Jobs was an emotional manipulator. But the honest truth is that they all got results. We can all become better entrepreneurs by studying the greats. We can become greats ourselves by studying the family tree that informed our favorite entrepreneurs. When Jobs needed to turn around his company and was brought back to Apple, he used an idea from his top mentor, Edwin Land, by creating a wallet-sized device capable of casually taking and sharing pictures to be used just like a pencil or a pair of glasses. For more business strategy breakdowns, subscribe to this channel. We'll see you again soon.